Hi everyone, uh, this is, I'm Spencer Morgan, the Chief Community Officer at Element 3 Health, and welcome to our show, People and Their Passions, uh, where we uh, talk to folks uh, about their passions and the role that passions and uh, communities play in their lives and try to have some fun and learn some things. And um, we, uh, uh, this week we have a special guest. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, our Element 3 Health Arts and Craft leader, Karen Parsons to in uh, introduce our special guest. Thank you. I, I have the opportunity to meet Michael through the company that we're that I work for. Um, it's an art supply company and we have a mutual love for art supplies. And that's how <laughs> I met Michael. But now getting to know him, it's like, I'm so excited to be able to share this with you. Um, he's, a, he's an artist, first of all, an artist. He is a He's a uh, grandfather, a husband, a maker. I mean, he does all kinds of, he does everything. He even sings. I looked on his, I saw him sing. It's amazing. So I'm going to just turn it over so that you can, uh, yeah, we can turn this over and we can talk to Michael. Nice to meet you. All right. So Karen, I believe you're up first. Oh, what question right. do you have for Michael? So my first question, well, the question for um, Michael is, what inspired you to create Rue Doodles? Oh, wow. Uh, for, well, first of all, that came out of uh, uh, I, I, so if you're if you're uh, if you're like me, I have to take notes on me to see what if I remember what I said because I am fast brain. So for those of you who wonder what that means, that means that my brain fires really fast. I think in my when I was a kid, they probably called it ADD, and they didn't know what to call ADD. They didn't know what I was, and so I, I spent a year and a half with a doctor building videos for him, and we helped him coin his company. Fast brain saying, well, that sounds so much more pleasant than ADD, ADHD. So I'm fast brain. And so that means that I can shift gears in a flash. I like seeing things go together. I like th seeing things weave together. I'll, I am a maker, first of all. And I'm a maker. And so I, I'm a maker before I even knew it had a name called artist, uh, a songwriter, a poet, uh, a guitar player, a welder, a builder. My dad was a builder. And so my name, is Han, and that's German, and that means rooster. So my grandkids, I thought, why don't they just call me Roo, short for rooster? And I'm kind of that, I'm 6'5", and I got a block head, a square chin, long hair, and I look like my face needs to be on the post office wall. And so, uh, and I'm, I'm kind of boisterous, and because I could sing, I love storytelling and being on the stage, and so that's kind of rooster's are the farm bard. They are the poet of the farm. They're the Chanticleer. They are the troubadour. And so that's kind of how I saw myself through school. And so I started painting one day, or actually I was coming out of the blacksmith shop and my wife says to me, you smell like metal. I'm going to give you a new hobby. And so one birthday, about 12 or 15 years ago, she brought me some art supplies and I had a good laugh. And she said, you just need a, an indoor hobby. And so I laid everything out and I realized I didn't know how to do either sketch or paint and so I went to the art store and I bought a book on sketching for the next six months I just started making little journal entries everywhere and trying to draw things and then we were in Washington DC and I had been traveling across the country on a speakers bureau speaking with a guy who was in Watergate Chuck Colson <laughs> and so he and I had become friends and so I said, I want to go stay at the Watergate and just call Chuck from there and make him laugh and say, hey, Chuck, I'm at the Watergate. This is where you got in trouble. So, and so I painted this blue soft shell crab and my wife said, that's good. And I said, what do you mean it's good? And she said, no, that's really good. But you should paint roosters because that's our namesake. And then I was in St. Augustine about two weeks later and I painted this shrimp and she said, oh my goodness, that is really good. But you should paint roosters. That's our namesake. It took me about another two years to one day go, if I paint a rooster and I'm doodling, I'll call it Roo Doodles. And so Roo Doodles was not out there. I bought RooDoodles.com. And so then I thought Roo Doodles is a great name. It's a verb because it's a, it's something you do. You're doodling this rooster, but it's also a noun. It's the Roo Doodles. So my paintings became Roo Doodles. And so that's the rest of the story. So it just, I stumbled into it and it's just been a fun word. And so Roo Doodles. And there's not a whole lot of Roo Doodles out there. So, so when you Google Roo Doodles, you get me. 
Oh, that's awesome, Michael. I'm already so inspired <coughs> just from this short visit. So we're all about community here at Elementary Health. So I'm really curious how you built this awesome community <laughs> that's surrounding Roo Doodles. Wow. Uh, first of all, let me just tell you that humbly, that's that was a marvelous surprise into what came. And, and if I have a moment, I'm going to tell you a story that I believe in from my core. Um, the story was told um, a long time ago by um, a gentleman who, who wrote a, a book and he's telling it about some other people. And I'll, I'll go to that story. But for me, I got to tell you how I stumbled into Roo Doodles. I just did. I stumbled into a community like this. People have always been important. And I think they're the most important thing, first of all. So what the fact that I'm visiting today on a health network tells me that you people um, have gotten yourselves out of the way a little bit already and you care about other people. I, th I think that's tremendous, okay? So I've always been either in camps or work for nonprofits and done something where people have to be served. And I love the fact that hospitality is a key to everything. So why shouldn't hospitality be to a key to artists too or makers? And so what happened was I was helping a consultant do better uh, presentations because he couldn't go visit people during COVID. And in the process, I thought the way to do this would be have a camera on me, have a camera on my desk, have videos that I could run through my computer. Wait. I need a television station. I thought, no, I need live stream. So I bought a piece of software. I did all this research on software. I found a piece of software that I love. And I thought, I need to learn to use this. And that way, they pay me as a consultant to teach them how to do this. And I thought, I should be painting using this. I started painting. And as the luck would have it, um, and it is now, when you think about reinventing yourself for 2020, as many of you, I'm sure, have had to do, you have to think, how are we going to do our job to reach who we reached? Uh, we were able to reach out to then. So what happened was I just threw a piece out on my Facebook page where people started following my zaniness and my root doodles. And I said, I'm going to paint live. And so working without a net and I just started saying, this is going to be fun. I don't know what I'm going to do. I didn't come here. This is not official. This is not proper. This is very relaxed and goofy. And if I, I wear a white shirt, if I spill paint on it, so what? I buy them at Goodwill. They're $4. And then I'll make shop rags out of them and I'll buy another one for $4 because I like painting in white shirts. It's just one of the silly things. This, the zaniness of my show and storytelling became the hook for people to say, his art really is about stories. And it's really about people. And it's really about how people affect people. And it's really about how story affects the heart. And it's really about a smile and it's really about a challenge. And so what happened was when I hung up those first few hours of shows and then there was a consistency involved. I did a hundred days straight at 857 every morning, a hundred days. And I said, if you want to do something different tomorrow, show up on this show. And I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to come prepared to do something. Wait, is that coming prepared? Maybe not, but I'll show up. And so I would just paint and tell a story or someone would ask a question and I would go down a road, which as you can see, I, I can. And, and that community started building. And then I realized, whoa, these people are showing up and they're willing to accept responsibility to help other people. So they started sharing the show because they thought it was funny or it connected them. And then I started asking them to do things. I didn't ask them to buy things, but I started saying, can you text other people and just wish them well today before you take your last sip today of a cup of tea or a cup of coffee? Think about two people right now, select one. And when you hang up right now, send them a text. Just say, I thought about you today. And, and that snowball started to roll down the hill. And in that hundred days, I had over a million views on my show. And what happened then was totally unexpected. I started being able to call people and interview them. And my, my show went from 5,000 views a day to 9,000 views a day to 10,000 views a day. Now it's dropped back down now because people are out there working. But the core of community that it built surprised everybody. It surprised art stores. It surprised uh, lots of people. It surprised the tea company. I drank Builder's Tea and they said, we like you. We'll send you some tea for the show because you're talking about us. I said, well, it took me 50 kinds of tea to find you. So then it became, people said, hey, we want to buy your art. And I said, I don't have that much art. So I'll just put it out online. 
the first email buys it. So I started selling art. And so anyway, it just, uh, it was a humbling thing, but I realized that uh, my story is this, and that story is that the community, good community should come first. And then any commerce and your people who want to sell their wares, if they're making something or building something or painting something or putting things together, the commerce will sort of follow great community. And that really is the way the work, world works better, I think. So I don't come across as a salesman because I just, I do this because my grandkids stories. I do this because I love art and that is one of my passions. But then you inspire other people to think, I bet I could do that. My question is you can, if you're willing to put in the time. So long answers, I'm sorry. But that takes you down that travel journey. That's sort of how I get there. I love it. Um, okay, I have a question for you, Michael. Oh. <laughs> I've heard you talk a little bit about this, but um, so what? What is the the key or some of the keys to finding your style, your own personal style, and kind of what would you say to? You know, we we have a lot of folks who are just beginning on their journey and their their art or their craft or their activity that they're they've discovered but with respect to i guess you know painting and drawing um okay. what you know some folks might be a little bit intimidated um and, always uh, you know, how do you how do you uh, do you have any words for finding your style and just getting your start um i i do and the reason i think i do is because i started fielding um um Spencer, a lot of questions about, I'm afraid to do this. What do I do first? Uh, oh my gosh, I can't draw a stick figure. And I always address that by saying, good, we're not drawing any stick figures. And so, um, so I always take that out of play. And then I'll say, well, I'm afraid of watercolor. I say, well, let's narrow it down. Are you afraid of water or are you afraid of color? So which is it? And so are you, so you don't like showers? So we're, all we're going to do is ask your brush to give your paper some a, a little sprinkle and shower and then put some color in there and just let it go where it wants to go. Don't worry about a sketch. In fact, draw the painting, draw the flower with just paint first and then sketch around it. You know, do it backwards for a while if you want to. That's acceptable in some abstract art. So what I try to do is start where you are, first of all. But here I'm going to back up even farther than that. If you don't love art, get off of that bus. OK, if you don't love painting, then maybe you're a, a whittler, a carver. Maybe you're a potter. Maybe you are a metal smith or a glass blower, which I love glass blowing, but it's expensive and I can't keep a forge. I, I have a blacksmith shop in my house so I can fire that up and, and forge some, but I can't keep a glass shop hot all the time. But I love molten glass. Uh, I keep my brushes in a glass that I blew in a glass shop and I love it. But for me, that starting thing, Spencer, is key because people are afraid. Are you afraid of water? Are you afraid of color? No. You know what you're afraid of? You're afraid you're going to make a mistake. And I say, so what? Because you will never make a great discovery in art if you don't, make a, if you don't waste a lot of paper, if you don't waste some paint, and if you don't make a lot of mistakes. Because how else are you going to do that? So for me, the, the visual voice, so I start with what you love first. If you're a quilter, and you like piecing quilts together. My mom was a quilter and I grew up playing under a quilting rack that, that was on a quilting frame in my house. I can still see the needles come through the batting underneath that, I get it, okay? I actually wrote poems for one of the a famous quilter called Georgia Bone Steel for years. I wrote poems for Georgia, I got to know her. We shot a television show for her once. And so, um, so if you're a quilter, if you're a wood carver, if you're a potter, if you want to be an artist, know that you're going to waste some materials. Know that you're going to get a few band-aids close by, but don't give up if that's your passion. But if you really don't like playing the piano, then sell the piano and do something that you love first, because I believe that everybody has that thing. What I do is that I think in art, if you give it time, if you, um, if you, if you give it time, if you uh, give it perseverance, I think the talent will start to show up, but you have to push to get there. And then I do believe that in the process, uh, the French call it pastis. You will see some art that you like, and you might gravitate in that direction. Copy it for a while. Don't copy it just to make it yours, but then find where you want to go. So you're going to have to do some research. I think your visual voice sometimes could come in two weeks. I think it may take two years or three years for you to find your visual voice. Unless you just wake up and say, 
you know what? This is in my blood. My grandmother was a quilter and I'm going to quilt too, or I'm going to tat, or I'm going to crochet, or I'm on needlepoint, or I'm going to do whatever it is. But I think you have to have that love to sit there and piece it together. And then I think you have to have a vision for where that's going to wind up. Is it going to grace the halls of my own table? Is it going to be out somewhere for my family to enjoy? And I think eventually you're, and I, call, I do it like this. I think your visual voice will show up and you'll go, this has become my style. This is, that's where my style comes in. People think they're going to start out of the starting blocks with their style intact. And they're going to make about three paintings that are bad. And then they're going to start doing good paintings. And that's, that isn't going to happen. Uh, great artists apprenticed for years before the master gave them. All they did was carry the buckets, you know? So I think you're gonna have to do some bucket carrying before you get to that point. But if you're afraid to start, you probably won't be an artist that takes chances. And if you're not, if you don't take chances at some point in time, I think it'll stunt your visual voice. And I think it will stunt your art and your craft. And I think the world will miss out. Michael, that was amazing. <laughs> that was such a great response. Um, <laughs> and those are things that I definitely in my painting and drawing club, things that, you know, I, I sort of share with my members. And I, I love how you mentioned when you keep showing up, the passion is there, the skill and talent will just naturally develop. I always tell my members, I'm like, it, it just, it will. <laughs> it can't not. If you keep showing up, it will. So I think I think they want to ask you when and you say and so here's what I asked them when they say when's this going to happen when am I going to find my style and so I look them in the eye down through the line and I'll point and I'll say how long is a rope <laughs> and they go what I can't answer that question I said duh I can't tell you when it'll show up I paint in the mornings at 8 57 and people go what does 8 57 mean and I'll say, it's just three minutes before nine. It's just different. But if you add it up, it equals 20. If you were to paint 20 minutes a day for 200 days, you would be amazed at your journal. So there you are. And I buy your uh, technique and what you're teaching too. Show up and do the work. Put the sweat equity into it and you'll be so much happier. I have been painting one hour classes now for 289 days. Not straight. I did a 100 days straight. And then I paint Monday, Tuesday, Saturday. I teach a class on Wednesdays, but those hours add up. So I'm close to three. I think, I think this Saturday will be 300 hours actually, or three, uh, 294 days, something like that. And so that's how this all started. You know, I wasn't I'm never going to teach a class, but at day 100 folks said, would you do this? And I said, no, I'm not skilled to do this. But then I thought, wait, I'm a storyteller who loves people who didn't know how to do this. I'm probably the perfect person. I didn't go to school that someone taught me balance and composition and contrast. I didn't do that. I just had to learn all that by suffering through it. But it's been worth that because in the suffering through, I've learned. That's great. Well, I have I'm a still question then for you. Yeah. Um, who are your muses and influences? Like, where do wow. you find your inspiration? All right, this will be fun for Karen's on the show today. And this will be fun for Karen because she uh, consults with a company that sort of reached out to me this year. Uh, not sort of reached out, they did reach out. Uh, Yasutoma is a, a, an Asian brush company in uh, California. And this has been really funny because um, I uh, paint, I wanted to paint loose, loose, loose roosters. I wanted to just throw paint there and see if I could find the rooster in it. And so I saw enough painting to say, I'm never going to be a quote, fine artist. And it's a funny story. And I've, I've included it in one of my little books that's coming out. I have a book that's coming out called Noodle Doodle Fiddle Piddle. And it's my rules for, for uh, if I had rules for basically art. And one of them is I walked into a gallery one night and I was just painting things around in this little thing. And a lady walked up and she said, what are you doing? I said, I paint roosters. And she said, what else do you paint? And I said, nothing roosters and she said well how boring <laughs> and I said well well uh, what do you paint she said nothing and I said well in that case you have to buy one of mine because you know by legendary and folklore you're gonna have to have a rooster in your kitchen or some bad things are gonna happen to fall upon your family and I'm just going on and so I didn't even smile I just looked at her like this and she said well I only buy fine art and I said this art is fine with me and so that's became the, the the, the title of the, the painting. So my point is, is that 
I wanted art that looked a little different and it looked like my storytelling style. Um, one day walking to a bookstore, I saw a rooster on the front of a book or on the, on, on actually the back cover, I think of a, a little book, a paperback book. And I, my friend tossed it to me. He said, did you paint this? And he held it up and I went, oh, no, but who did? And I looked at it and it was a Chinese artist by the name of Lian Zen. And I looked at Lian Zen's work and said, oh my gosh, this guy, I will never do what he's doing, but I, he will be, he will be my muse. I will watch him. I will, he's inspired me just by, I bought two of his books. I took them home. And two weeks later, a notification came from some friends of mine in Boone, North Carolina, in an art store, Chief Joe's Art, who said, Lian Zen is going to be teaching a class here. And I called him on the phone and said, sign me up now. And he said, well, we're not signing up people in September. And it's just July. I said, sign me up now. So I went and had eight days with him. And uh, it was hilarious because I loved bamboo brushes. And so he said, you're going to have to have bamboo brushes. I'm going like, great. I didn't even know what they were until two weeks ago because they hold so much water and they splash around. And so now Karen and I've had this long conversation about bamboo brushes. And so Lian Zen, um, Chinese artists like that. Mako Fujimura is a, a Japanese artist that I absolutely love his stuff. Um, there are, and, and then for about two years, I will tell you this, I didn't want to go in and look at any other art because I was afraid that I might copy art and I wanted my style to just sort of be on its own and go. And so Lian is probably the biggest, but then my wife was an art major in college. And so there's not too many galleries that we haven't plowed through. And I've looked and been a part of that. So research now more than I ever did. But early on, it was probably just a, a Chinese artist and a Japanese artist who really affected a tall German guy about art. So inspiring to hear from you, Michael. What a treat. Um, you're such Thank a passionate you. person. And just wondering, you know, how do you balance that? How do you balance between, you know, your different passions, whether it's physical or, you know, mental, spiritual, um, creative, all those different things? What do you do? What's your secret? Um, uh, claiming that there is enough time to do the things that you really love and then probably putting a limit on some things that you wish you could do, but maybe now is not the time. I really do believe this. You said spiritual. I believe everything does have a season. Okay. If I were to turn open my Bible and look in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, I'd probably say to everything, there is a time and a season. And so I would believe that, um, Folks say, gosh, can you imagine how good you would be had you started painting in high school? And I went, I didn't want to paint in high school. I was a, I was a, a decathlon uh, person. I was an athlete. And then I, I, I felt the draw of the flame and I wanted to make knives and fireplace tools. And I wanted, to, I wanted the smell of metal to be on me. And I love that. And so, um, so for me, I think it's been a seasonal thing that I don't regret. But uh, Carol and I, my wife, have this thing too, is that we honestly believe that every year we try to learn something new, now, even that we don't excel at it. So like this last year, we went to a glass blowing classes twice to make a bowl, to make our kids all glasses. And so we just, and so they wanted us to make paperweights. And so we had a discussion and said, no, we don't have time to make paperweights. We're here to make a bowl. And he says, do you know how hard it is to make a bowl? I go, I'm sure it's going to be difficult. But do you know how hard it is to blacksmith a, a, a chef's knife? And he goes, no. And I go, okay, then we're in the same boat. And so, but I think it's, it's setting aside that time. That's why in the mornings when I sit down with my first cup of tea, I will literally spend eight, five, seven, 20 minutes sketching something in a little journal. And crudely, and I, I will do that with a, a fountain pen. And I'll pop the top open of a little fine point pen and I'll sketch something there and I'll open up my little box. Here it is right here. I thought you'd get a kick out of this. It says Altoids. If I open this box up, there it is right there. That's my palette. And I keep a water brush there and I'll paint something in the first 10 minutes of my sitting down every day. And I'll go, I didn't have 20 minutes, but I just took 20 minutes and I feel like I fed my passion a little bit and then I'll move on. Some days if my phone doesn't ring, I may stay there 40 minutes and I may turn out 15 dragonflies like I did the other morning. And then I got some people who said, could we buy some of your dragonflies? And so I posted them and I posted them at a fair rate and I sold them. And so my point is, is that, wow, I'm glad I had time to do that. So I think um, everybody wants to do everything. I would say for a season, pick two. 
And then, and then never, you don't have to master them. I'll never master watercolor. And I'm not that good. I just love my style. And that sounds arrogant, but I like my style. I like it because it's my voice. So just, just pick three and then maybe narrow it down and say, for the next month, I'm just going to paint bluebirds. And I did that. I painted 50 bluebirds and then I painted 50 cardinals and then I painted 50 grasshoppers. And that sounds crazy. But then I went, I like these bluebirds. I'm going to paint 50 more. So it's where I, it's, there's a little bit of discipline in this loose style. And I hope that helps. That discipline a little bit drives my passion. My passion drives my discipline, I should say. Okay. So, but I think there's a season. You look at it and say, realistically, application, I can't really direct, you know, I've never played piano at Carnegie Hall, but I don't play piano. And so I'd go like, well, that's not a reality for me. So I'm not going to do that. But I could play the harmonica there because I play harmonica, but they haven't invited me yet. So, uh, but it's, but realistically, they're not going to ask me that either. So I'll put my goals into reach, but I'll push a little bit too for my goals, but I narrow them down. I hope that helps a little bit. That's kind of cloudy, but okay. Yeah. Well, this has been so great. Well, I know we, I noticed we have a couple minutes left. I, I thought of another one last question, which was, so did I hear you say, Michael, that you kind of jumped into this a, a little bit out of the pandemic? Um Oh, certainly. Uh, the yeah. online, I was painting beforehand and I was selling and I, I did my first children's book uh, three years ago before the pandemic. I'd had a poem and I have I have four books rolling in my head right now. I'm constantly writing songs and poetry and ideas. And so I have to pay attention to the question I was just asked that there's some things that I journal those down and I put them on a shelf so that I know I don't lose them because I'll forget them. So I keep those things on a list, but I have to prioritize that list. So I did start pre-pandemic, but pandemic is when I started March 27th, I think I started live. I just opened up a live stream and said, here we go. Right. And I already had people follow me, but that's when it sort of took off. And I said, I am going to show up every morning for a hundred days. It didn't start that way. It started 20. And then folks said, this has been so fun. Will you continue? Then it went to 40. Then it went to 50 and 70. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking, you know, looking for something uh, positive out of this horrible, horrific pandemic. This, the, you know, I think it. We've seen that a lot of folks have been exposed to the opportunity to find community online, virtually, in these virtual clubs and communities that we've created, and um, and and now as the world kind of opens up, um, folks are kind of struggling with the. You know the, these real friends that they've made, and the great accessibility of being able to jump on the computer and um, visit with their their different communities. And um, I, uh, I think I hope they continue doing that, Spencer. Yeah. I, I hope they continue to um, to say, you know what? Uh, there's a lot of talk when you're when you're hanging around the drinking fountain. You go like, oh, that's online. But I'll tell you, you can move the mountain online. I have people, and I'll give you one case in point. There are some uh, senior facilities in Florida that wanted some original art in their facilities. And some of our artists that I've, that follow me on my page were involved in that. And so I'm always saying, you should do something. Give away a piece of your art today. Get it hanging on the wall somewhere. Just give it to somebody. And a lady sent up a thing on the page, uh, on a page that they made a page that follows my page. It's called Ruse Crew. And, and she was shipped 200 pieces of art, 200 pieces of small art. And all that art went to her and she was able to take it in and, and let people choose four or five pieces of art. And out of that, choose two pieces of art to frame and put in their place. And so that community is not going to stop. And so I hope that you find a place that you need to connect with those people. Don't just think it's this and there's a, a wall. The way you're gonna break this glass wall down, I put my hand here, is that you're gonna to have to pick up your other phone and say, hey, can I get in touch with you? Can I text you? Can I call you? Can I be in touch? Can you send me an email? And yeah, it'll take me a while, but I'll respond. So let's connect the best we can. I connect with Sue Kane right now. I just mailed Sue Kane some paintings. You all don't know Sue Kane, but I'll tell you this, she's in Australia. And, and so she's been on every painting class that I've taught so far. And she goes, I'm painting things. Here's the pictures of them. And she's blessing people in her world with, with art. So tell me that community doesn't work. And I think you're wrong. It works big time. So those of you who are listening, if you want the input, 
then you have to do sort of if you if you want the muscle, do the work, but 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 break the walls down a little bit too, and and make it so you catch up, uh, and send people notes and respond back, and so. Uh, we have done things for children with disability where I painted for them one day and I opened the show up and they received money to help those children buy painting supplies. It was amazing. And, and my friend called me, he said, who are these people? And I said, from four corners of the world, they say they want to touch. And so they've touched through this medium. So I hope that's an answer to your question, but I Perfect. believe you guys yeah. are doing it online, but I think the people listening have to realize they got to part to play too and that's where i don't mess around on my show where i'll say you can do this yourself uh carol and i have one more rule that i'll leave you with today and it's in my little doodle fiddle piddle book sounds like a salesman don't know but it's, it's it's withhold nothing and and i don't think you should withhold things from people they say i want to know how to i want this recipe and you go well, that's my grandmother's recipe and it was a secret and i can't tell you i'm going like well give me a break I work with two food service companies. We'll break that thing down. And scientifically, we'll know everything's in it by in the next 15 minutes. Just tell me what the recipe is. I don't want to market it. I just want to cook it. And so if you come to my house and somebody says, hey, I, don't, I wish I knew how to weld. I'll say, Spencer, wear your long pants and your boots. And in two hours, I'll have you putting something together in a welding shop because I know how to do that. I'll teach you. So I think that's the mentality that I'm trying to get people to do where they live. Not just me teaching out this way, but for them to go, now you go to the middle school and you teach a third grade class in art. So that's what I'm asking for, okay? Fantastic. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us, Michael. It's a real pleasure. Um, I think this was a fantastic first episode of thank Elementary you. Free Health's People and Their Passions. Thank you so much. I am, uh, I'm honored to be here. Now I'm going to go change hats and put on a director's hat and shoot a video where I'm, I'm coming to you from a company today. And so I've got to shoot video for the rest of the afternoon. And they thank you for inspiring here. us, Michael. Oh, yes, thank you so thank much, you Karen. So much. Blessings to you. Yes, Blessings thank to you. you. It was such a pleasure meeting you, Michael. Thank you. Good meeting such you guys. Uh, e email me anytime and just say, hey, uh, remind me who you are. And I'd love to respond back to you if I can do that. Blessings to you all. Thank you, all right. Michael. Thank you. Bye-bye.